So, thank you for coming, everyone. We are at the energy sector. My name is Ben Varga, and this is Frank Gallegos over here. We are two senior analysts of the sector. And uh, these are the two junior analysts, Irving Medina and Alex Trevino. And uh, Irving is going to go over just a few details, <coughs> excuse me, uh, a few details about the oil and gas industry. So before we get into the presentation, I'd like to go give you an overview of the industry. Uh, it's mainly broken down into three categories. Uh, one of the categories are upstream, which is mainly composed of exploration and production. Another uh, category is the midstream uh, category, which is composed of companies uh, that do the transportation. And our third category is the downstream uh, category, which is mostly composed of refining and marketing. So we want to get into the kind of the three trends that are going to be the driving force for oil prices coming in the future, uh, especially from a U.S. perspective. Uh, we have U.S. crude inventories at an all-time high, uh, growing demand for refined products from overseas, and uh, OPEC cuts, which we saw, but we're expecting to see what weather compliance is going to be a, a thing. Yeah, yeah and to add a little bit more color to uh, the crude inventories, so what's going on right now is we have. Uh, supply is at an all-time high, so that is driving prices down. Now, as far as the downstream segment goes, refineries are fine with uh, you know being in the 50, 70 range uh, of the WTI. However, um, the upstream segment is just struggling. So uh, that was one of the things that we really had to look out for. Yeah, and another thing, uh, the OPEC cuts. So, like Ben was saying, uh, inventories are at all uh, are at an all-time high. So. Uh, Last November in Vienna, you know, OPEC uh, decided to cut production from uh, to about uh, 1.164 million barrels per day, which was you know huge. And we got uh, we've got um, countries that are you know have to be compliant, and then we have countries that are you know doing this voluntarily, such as Russia, who are you know contributing about 300,000 uh, barrels per day. And it's still you know their goal is to push uh, push prices back up to their long term long-term averages, so we, we want to go ahead and wait to see how that plays out, and we're going to be talking a little bit more about the upcoming meeting in May and how, uh, you know, that's one of the factors that we, we're looking at. So this is just taking a look at our current holdings within our portfolio. We uh, hold some companies uh, within the upstream category, some in the downstream category, and we also have some in the integrated and refining category. Yeah, so these are some of the metrics that we use for our model, uh, the risk metrics, growth, and pro uh, profitability. And so just to kind of add some color to that too, so as far as valuation goes, um, we believe that um, this industry has hit rock bottom. So uh, from here on, it's just all the way up. Now, the reason why we're looking into uh, uh, trailing 12-month sales, I know it's kind of irregular, right? It's uh, more like a retail. Um, sector um, valuation metric. However, um, we believe that now that companies hit that rock bottom, we want to see how they can capture uh, market share. And so what we did basically is we had a ranking model uh, where we brought in all of these metrics and uh, we assigned equal weights to them. And so what we did is we ran Solver to maximize our R squared. And, uh, um, trailing 12 month sales gave us the best value. Uh, we ended up with a 0.8 of R squared, um, which is pretty high. And then for uh, and that's for the upstream. And for the downstream part, we had uh, 0.69. And I can pull the model later on, walk y'all through if y'all want me to. Um, but let's move on to our downstream rank. So what we're seeing here is our downstream ranking. Uh, as you can see, we have a couple companies here on the cheap side. Uh, and we use the, this ranking to come up with our shortlist. Uh, as you can see here, we had some companies that we ranked lower than our EV to 12 month sale of metric. Uh, we also have just one company, Chevron, uh, that ranked a little bit higher. Uh, so this is our downstream shortlist, and we're going to talk about some of the upstream companies as well. Right, so kind of like the same methodology, we kind of try to pinpoint which companies we can do some equity research on and find more uh, information about. And uh, this was kind of, you know, kind of the same thing as upstream. So uh, here's our upstream short list, and one of the companies that we actually did quite a bit of further research on was Noble Energy, uh, which we found to be the most interesting for, for our portfolio. Sorry, so how did uh, integrated oil companies get treated? You talked about Chevron as a downstream company, but they, and Chevron and Exxon, all these companies are, are across the gamut? Um, yeah, exactly. So what we did um, is that, so, 
we were just basically using, um, well, as far as refineries go, right? So Exxon was integrated oil, uh, under integrated oil and refineries, so we deemed it the, more, uh, the most appropriate if we have them under the downstream segment. So that was just your subjective determination, or was it based on profitability contribution? Um, honestly, it was more. It was more from our perspective. We didn't really know where to rank, where to put them, and since they, uh, there are only a few companies who fell into that segment, we could not have done a uh, really good analysis, just sort of like a comparables, right? And, and just to be clear, you, you had a, a long list of different yes. metrics, um, but then on the table you narrowed it down to one metric. Um, are you using that one metric, uh, which you mentioned has the most relation, uh, the highest relationship to, to the output? Yes. Uh, are you using that exclusively, or are those also those others also being incorporated? So they were being incorporated. What happened? So uh, these metrics right here, uh, some of them were used for the upstream segment, uh, such as um, barrel of oil equivalent growth, and some of them were used for the downstream segment. Um, and so what we did, we brought in these valuation metrics. And some of them didn't give us uh, good enough R squared, so we just decided to not to go with them. And uh, that's how we created our, our short list, is um, we use EV to tw um, trailing 12 month sales. And since that gave us uh, good R squared, uh, we decided to do further research by uh, reading equity research reports, um, reading investor relations slides, and just doing a more in-depth um, financial analysis instead of statistical analysis. Okay, and that's a snapshot of Enterprise Valley to trailing 12 months? Because their sales have moved around quite a bit with the yeah. quality price, right? Yeah, so that's, uh, that was a snapshot of that. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, and here we go. Okay. Noble. Yeah, so just a brief uh, brief overview of the company. So they're headquartered out in uh, Houston. They are an E&P com uh, company, uh, 14 billion, so around a mid cap. Uh, their output is about 418,000 uh, barrels per day, 1.4 billion in proven reserves, majority in the U.S., but they do have uh, holdings in uh, Israel. Uh, their abandoned capital expenditures are between 2.3 and 2.6 billion in 2017, uh, and so they have 3.5 billion in revenue, up from about 3.1 in 2015. And they just recently completed an acquisition of another energy company, giving them uh, a larger um, uh, market uh, market share uh, in relation to the Southern Delaware Basin. So it gave them, you know, more uh, more land, so to speak. And just as some color to that too. So uh, they had one of their drilling sites right there. So with this acquisition, uh, basically they can they can combine those two together. Yeah. Yeah, and so just uh, an industry overview as well. So the demand for natural gas is expected uh, to grow due to the strict uh, emission regulations, uh, as well as the, the, EI, the energy information. Um, uh, administration predicts natural gas spot prices to be 23% higher in 2017, 12% higher in 2018. So that's a really good opportunity for the, for the company, as well as you know, the Trump's oil-friendly uh, uh, policies. So here we kind of want to demonstrate where their, uh, where their operations are headquartered and where areas in the U.S. they kind of uh, run their business. So they have two uh, here in Texas, uh, one in the Delaware Basin, one kind of close by here in Eagle Ford. Uh, the other is up in Colorado, which is, you know, known to have quite a bit in, in reserves. And the other up in the Northeast, <coughs> New York, part of. Uh, and so what we did basically is we had a DCF model. Um, and so our assumptions were margins expanding back to 25% now. In 2016, the margins were down to 21. However, now the oil prices are coming back up. And uh, with these acquisitions, we, we believe, and that's, that was one of the things that they um, voiced, that they have been improving their operations. So we, we expect it to go back to 25% now. The company is currently trading at 7.3 um, or 7 times um, EBITDA multiple, so we assume the 7.5 exit multiple because we believe that the company is undervalued, and uh, that gave us a 4.47, I mean, yeah, 4.47 percent uh, implied perpetuity growth. Now, all of our assu assumptions came from um, analysts um, from Bloomberg, and uh, we took a more conservative approach to that, so we discounted whatever they were saying and plugged that into our model. 